you would, let's be opening our Bibles to the book of Numbers, chapter 21. And let's put our markers there at Numbers, chapter 21. And if you're using a digital device, I think there's a way to drop a marker there as well. Just don't ask me how to do it. I still haven't figured that one out on mine. I can drop it, but I can't find it later. So, Before we begin with the lesson this evening, um, another announcement I failed to tell Ron about this evening. Uh, Sister Maxine called um, before services began. And she's not here tonight. Her leg is still giving her problems. And uh, she left early this morning because of the pain she was facing. And so she's staying in this evening and kind of trying to keep it medicated and try to keep uh, some rest there with that. So let's continue to keep her in our minds and in our prayers. You know, I like hiking. <clears throat> I don't do it very much. It's probably been seven, eight, nine, ten years since I've been hiking. And my extent of hiking is walking on a trail through some woods, maybe up a not-too-steep mountain, but it's still in the great outdoors. And I've even been camping before. But one of the things, I remember as a kid, anytime you were going through the woods, parents would always warn you about is snakes. You know, well, you got to watch out for snakes. And um, the bad thing about snakes, especially rattlesnakes, they will warn you, okay, with a rattlesnake with a rattler there. The problem is, quite oftentimes, we get upon them before we realize what's going on. And then we get bit. Now, I remember, all, especially when you, were, uh, when you were going through school and everything, and, and uh, Cub Scouts type things, that always tell you to wear long jeans and maybe even boots. You know, so if they did strike, you would be possibly okay. So we're taught to avoid snake bites. We're taught to avoid snakes. We're told to be very careful when we're going out into the wild. The children of Israel, though, had first-hand experience of snake bites. And not just your average old garden snake or, or a ribbon snake or king snake, but a very venomous, poisonous serpent. And we find this story in Numbers 21. I decided this evening to try to figure out what would be a really just a good title for the lesson to make it very simple. We're going to talk about how to avoid snake bites. How to avoid snake bites. You've got to do it from time to time, throw a catchy title out there, I guess. But we learn a lot from this particular text. Let's begin reading there again in Numbers chapter 21. What, what is amazing about this, it, and it shows the yo-yo effect of the children of Israel um, in the relationship with God. In the first three verses there, they had faced a conflict with king of Arad, the Canaanite. And they said to the Lord, this is the Israelites talking in verse 2 of Numbers 21. They said, if you will indeed deliver this people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. And the Lord listened to the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites. And they utterly destroyed them in their cities. So the name of that place was called Hormah, Hormar. So here we have them saying, if you will deliver us, we will destroy the cities. And so the Lord did. So they leave this location, and they travel on to another area in verse 4. They, jour they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go to the land of Edom. And the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. Now, us sitting here in a nice, comfortable building, and we have our nice homes and our cars to drive in and so forth, it's hard to imagine what they were really going through. Imagine living in heat, living out of tents. You've been roaming in the desert and the wilderness, always having to look for water, always eating manna every day, same thing, same thing every day. This was their life. And so they are now being moved again, and they go to another area, and they become discouraged in verse 4. So verse 5, the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people. And many of the people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned against you. We have sinned 
against you. Let me read that. I've skipped a whole line. We've sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he takes away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent, put it on a pole, and set it, and so it was. If a serpent had bitten anyone, when he, lived, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. So here they are. They're in the wilderness, and they're complaining against God. If you want to avoid the snake bite, and if they had wanted to avoid what came upon them, the first thing they needed to have done was trust the Lord. That was the problem. You know, you look at this and everything that they, they did, and we're going to talk about it here, but the fundamental sin that they committed was they did not trust the Lord. It wasn't enough that he had delivered them once and again and again and again. They became discouraged in verse 4. Why would you become discouraged unless you did not trust the Lord? Why would you become discouraged unless you did not believe that He was going to take care of you? Unless you did not believe that He would be the ultimate guide? And so then being very discouraged in verse 4, they said to the Lord, speaking out against Him and Moses, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in this wilderness? They thought they were going to die. They did not trust the Lord. Had they trust the Lord, things would have been fine. They would have been able to have persevered and continued on, but they failed to do that. For us today, we have to always remember to trust the Lord. It's the times that we no, no longer trust the Lord that we find ourselves engaging in Sin. Think about the Apostle Paul for a minute. Let's turn over to the book of Philippians. The Apostle Paul comments about how he was able, able to endure. Let's first go to Philippians chapter 3. Two different passages here to consider with this. Notice there in Philippians chapter 3. Let's come down in the text there to verse 12. Paul says, not that I have already attained, Philippians 3, verse 12, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on, that I lay may hold, that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. He says, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, he says, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. They should have pressed on while in the wilderness, continued to walk, continued to follow the Lord. They were wandering in the wilderness because of their sin. At least they could have offered some measure of repentance and continued to follow the Lord. Verse 15, Therefore let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. And if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, verse 16, to the degree that we have already obtained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. We need to trust in God. We need to follow Him. Even if we commit some sort of horrendous sin that brings about years of consequence upon us here on this earth, we still follow Him. We still persevere. We do not fail. We do not walk away from our Lord. When we look at the life of the Apostle Paul, we find an individual who always found strength within God. Notice in chapter 4 of Philippians, and let's start in verse 10. Philippians chapter 4, verse 10. Paul writes, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at your last care for me has flourished again, though, the, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to care, to suffer need. He says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We put our trust in the Lord. As long as we are putting Him first, as long as we are seeking to do His will, we will succeed. Now, it doesn't mean that we won't have physical problems on this earth. I heard from Travis Day that Andrew Lehman, 
who's, gonna, who's holding the meeting of Mustang. When he was traveling up to Mustang from the Houston, Texas area, he had a tire trouble, ended up having to replace all four tires. Sometimes things like that happen. But no matter what we are facing spiritually, we can always overcome and we can endure all things through Christ who strengthens us. But we have to trust in God. And I recognize there are a lot of physical challenges we may face, but we must not let them get in our way. Turn with me over to Matthew chapter 5 for just a moment. Here we have Jesus at the Sermon on the Mount. I said chapter 5, it's actually chapter 6 where we need to be. And notice there beginning in verse 25. There's a reason why he tells the people not to worry about the physical things. He says in verse 25 of Matthew chapter 6, he says, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Think about the times in your life when you have been overwhelmed with worry regarding something physical. Now how big of a drain was that on everything else in your life? Think about a marital relationship. If a husband and wife is steeped in worry, it robs from their relationship. And it takes away from the quality of relationship that they have with their children. Because they're always consumed in worrying about this or worrying about that. So he says in 26 there, look at the birds of the air. For they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you by worrying one cubit can add to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now, if God so clothed the grass of the field which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things sufficient for the day of its own trouble. Children of Israel worried about the food. What manna again? And again? And again? There's no water today. When is God going to... It reminds me of a, of, of a child. Sometimes a young child will get something on their mind and they just won't let it go. You, you, they, it's like they, they've been in the car for... for 10 days, and you've not bought them a drink, and it's only been 30 minutes. You know, this is the way they were. Very childish in their behavior. If they had simply said, you know what, we messed up horribly, and what I'm re referencing is when they followed the poor advice of the 10 spies and were too cowardly to take the land. That's why they were roaming in the wilderness. If they had said, all right, we messed up, our generation did, Let's follow God till the day that we die so our children will be prepared. Then they would have stayed, they never would have worried a day about anything. And so he's telling us here not to worry. Let us trust in God. It may not be the greatest of food that we want, but we will be fed. It may not be the nicest of clothing that we have, but we will be clothed. It may not be the largest of dwelling places, but it, we will have a place to live. As long as we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto us. Let us trust him. And let us trust him to remember our sins and to forget those things that we have done if we repent. This was the promise found over in Joel or Jeremiah 31, beginning in verse 31, but we're going to Hebrews. Here the Hebrew writer quotes this prophecy in Hebrews chapter 8. Now, we won't read all this, but I want to draw your attention specifically. He starts in verse 8 of Hebrews 8 and references the coming of a new covenant that God will make with Israel and with the house of Judah. Now, come down in the text there, if you would, to verse 12. Of this new covenant, he says, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. I think sometimes 
the troubles that we face is we maybe don't really trust that God will forgive us or that God does forgive us. Sometimes we may do something and we end up not forgiving ourselves. And, and i got to admit, that's part of overcoming guilt. All right, if you've been forgiven of something by God, then you need to forgive yourself. Oftentimes we don't and, and, and we, we feel really bad about it. And, and we need to do fruits worthy of repentance. We'll talk about that later in the lesson. And trust God to forgive us. No matter what we've done within the past. I wonder if the Apostle Paul ever laid in bed at night thinking, I can't go on. I'm not worthy enough to go on because of all the things that I've done. Now, he kept himself in proper, humble spirit because he knew the things that he had done, but he kept going because he knew that God had forgiven him of everything that he had done. But we have to trust God. We have to trust in him, to follow him, to rely upon him, and to know that he forgives. Had Israel trust God, they would not have been bitten by those serpents that day. Step number two, if we want to avoid snake bites, is don't rebel against God. It's that simple. Turn back to Numbers 21. We must not rebel against God. Observe there, if you would, in Numbers chapter 21, what the people said. Verse 4, we saw them being discouraged. Verse 5, the people spoke against God and against Moses. There you see rebellion. They're speaking against God. They're speaking against Moses. And so they said, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water for our soul loathes this worthless bread. Here we have the people not only trusting in God, they are accusing God of intentionally leading them to the wilderness to die in the wilderness. And truly, the New Testament writer tells us that their bodies were scattered throughout the wilderness. It makes you wonder if you would have walked the same track about a year or two later that they had, you know, once they finally got to the land of Canaan, how many tombstones, how many grave sites would you find? of the thousands of people that had to die in the wilderness. Someone said, how do you get thousands of, pil- of people dying in the wilderness? Over, that we had over 600,000 men on foot when they left Egypt. 600,000. Not counting women and children. And then just a handful, maybe just a, within a couple of years, if even that long, God says, okay, you're going to roam in the wilderness for 40 years until everybody who, when they came out of Egypt who is 20 and older, dies. We're not talking about 400, 500. We're talking about thousands of people. Their bodies scattered throughout the wilderness because of rebellion against God. Well, this is what we're looking at here. These same people, they spoke out against God. They say that you intentionally brought us into this land to die in the wilderness. And, and not only that, we've got to have manna, this worthless bread. Talk about a rebellious people. And so, as a result of that, God dealt with their rebellion. But before we look at that, I want to, I want to share with you Psalms for just a moment. David, many years later, looks back on this event and uses it as an opportunity to remind the children of Israel why they should not rebel against the Lord. This is Psalm 78. And there are two verses specifically here in Psalms chapter 78. And and the whole context here, we're going to 23 in just a second here. But the whole context of this is talking about God's kindness to Israel, despite the the time and time again of rebellion. Uh, I'll give you specifically, and and we are going to 23 here in just a moment. But notice there with me in verse 8, or verse 7 that they may set their hope in God and not forget his works of God, but keep his commandments, and may not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not set its heart aright and whose spirit was not faithful to God. David reminds him that God provided for these people. Now verse 23, Yet he had commanded the clouds above and opened the doors of heaven and had rained down man on them to eat and given them of the bread of heaven. Think about something they didn't have to do. 
they didn't have to till the ground. Think about it. During the 40 years in the wilderness, how many men, I wonder, took a, took a plow to the ground to sow seed? They were wanderers in the wilderness. How many of them had to go out and go hunting and had to bring home game to feed their families? They didn't have to work their, for their food other than going to collect it every day. But it still wasn't enough. They griped, they complained, they moaned, and they groaned. Now verse 40 of Psalm 78. How often they provoked him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. Song that says, in the desert of sorrow and sin. This was the people of Israel. Walking in the desert. It's interesting, one, one of the, the regions of the desert that they walked through, if you look on some of the older maps, is spelt Z-I-N, I believe. The wilderness of sin. Not because they sinned, it's what it was actually called there. But how poetic is that? Wandering in the wilderness of sin, and they themselves were sinning and rebelling against God. So, God dealt with their rebellion here in Numbers chapter 21. There in verse 6, this is what God did. Number 6 of chapter 21. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. Notice that. He sent fiery serpents. Fiery doesn't mean they were literally on fire, but it means that they were very, very venomous, very dangerous, very poisonous. And so he sends them these snakes. Can you imagine? You've been you know, you're sitting there maybe in your little tent, and mom's getting on her kick, or dad's getting on her kick about manna. Manna, again, there's only so many ways you can cook manna. You know, and, and really, if he brought us out into the wilderness to save us, he's doing a poor job about it because we're going to die in this wilderness. And all of a sudden, you feel a sharp pain in the back of your calf. And then the wife feels a sharp pain in her thigh. And then the kids sitting around, joining in with this grumbling, they are bitten by these snakes. Imagine that. And then you find out the reason why. Because the people rebelled. And it wasn't a snake bite where you got mildly slick. Some of the people began to die. Not some of them, I said. Many of the people of Israel died because of their rebellion against God. Brethren, if we rebel against God, this bite of sin is going to separate us from God. And, and sometimes the way that it works, and, and really this is the way that it should work in some ways. If we allow ourselves to give in to sin, there should be that sharp pain, if you would, within our conscience of our mind saying, hold on, we just sinned against God. And it should bring us great pain, if you would, to get us to come back to God. But to, to make this in parallel with this story, the bite of the serpent when we sin is essentially that separation from God. Think about it. You, you're doing something that you shouldn't do. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be nice if in our lives, every day that we walked with God, we saw him? Wouldn't it be nice to know he's right here by our side? And we look up, and there he is. And then one day we look up, and he's not around us. It's kind of like a kid in a store. Mom says, stay right by my side. Stay right here by my side. Don't go anywhere. And you stop to look at something as a young person and not realizing your mom's walking because she's heading towards something. She thinks you're right behind her. And then a couple minutes later, you look up and mom's not around. She's nowhere around. And immediately you begin to panic. Not to mention hearing your mom yelling all over Walmart because she can't find you either. Be nice if we could see him. But by faith, we know that he's there. And if we sin, we know that we're not with him. Over in 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, the English Standard Version says, Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. The King James Version says that sin is a transgression of the law. Any time that we sin, we miss the mark. The Greek word translated to sin kind of carries the idea of to err or to miss the mark. 
So any time that we do something that's contrary to the law of God, we've missed the mark. We have erred, we have sinned, we have broken His law. And as a result, we are separated from Him. James talks about this in James chapter 1, verses 13 through 15, as sin bringing forth a type of death. And we'll talk about that. Turn over to James chapter 1 for just a moment, beginning there in verse 13. James writes, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Now, I would suggest this death is spiritual separation from God. Because if we allow a temptation to yield sin within our life, we are no longer in fellowship with God. 1 John chapter 1, beginning in verse 5 and going down through 10, clarifies that. Romans chapter, chapter 5, beginning in verse 12 and reading down through verse 19, clarifies that sin brings about this spiritual death, this death, this separation from God. And so if we allow ourselves, like the Israelites, to rebel against God and to sin, then we find ourselves standing alone. And if we don't repent and turn away, then we will die in the wilderness of sin like the children of Israel did. Now, thankfully, just as there was a reconciliation between God and the children of Israel, pulling them back together again, if you have allowed yourself to walk in sin or you are not a Christian and you're still living in sin, then there is likewise a reconciliation. Here's what you need to do. If by chance you are bitten by the snake of sin or that bite of sin, then do like the children of Israel and take the steps of repentance. Now think about that for a moment. Take the steps of repentance. Have you ever considered in this story that we've been looking at, that when they were told by God what to do, that it was actually a step of repentance. Now, I'll show you why I say that. Let's turn back now to Numbers chapter 21. Beginning there in verse 7. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he takes away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole. And so it was, if a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. Now, for a moment, let's kind of talk about the solution here. It's kind of an odd solution. The Lord told Moses to build, uh, to to make a fiery serpent out of uh, bronze. Some commentators suggest that it was more like, more probably copper. And there was probably copper um, veins throughout that region there. And would have been very plentiful. But they also suggest, and this is just pure speculation, that the copper color would have looked more red. More along the lines of, um, of, of, of repentance and not so much repentance I've lost the word that I'm looking for, but remember back a couple chapters in Deuteronomy what they were told to do with the red heifer and the ashes of the red heifer in dealing with sin. So some suggest that there was a very intentional purpose to making this serpent uh, bronze or possibly red uh, if made out of copper. But anyway, it seems kind of odd. Here, Moses, I want you to, to, to shape this, being told by a God who's against idolatry, bear in mind, okay? to make this serpent and put it up on a pole and all they have to do is look at it. They have to crawl out of their tent. They have to go to where it's at. But they have to look at it. It's all they have to do. And they would be healed. This does not make one bit of sense unless we see one thing that was required by God of these people. There was one thing that he required of them at this point, and that was their trust. Because they had to trust him enough 
to follow through with this. They didn't trust him in the first place, did they? And this is the steps of repentance we're talking about. Their sin was that they didn't trust God. So they moaned and they complained and they groaned. Now he's telling them, effectively, essentially, you've got to trust me. Trust me enough to look upon the serpent and you will be healed. You will be saved. What about those of us who have been bitten by sin? Is there not some similar steps of repentance that we have to take? If we have rebelled against God and we have turned against Him, the idea of repentance is not simply to be sorrowful. I've seen plenty of people in my life who were sorry for what they did, but they didn't change. The idea in the Greek word translated as repentance means to turn about. If you're walking this way, if you're heading west, and you repent, you turn and you head east. You go in another direction. You go in the opposite direction. This is what he's telling them to do in looking up to the bronze and serpent there to trust in him. Well, for us today, there is someone that we have to look up to. Just as they had to look up to the, to the serpent up on the pole, we have to look up to someone today. Turn with me to John chapter 3 for just a moment. Turn with me to John chapter 3. Jesus in his discussion with Nicodemus. You know, and someone may say, why did God choose this particular way of, of healing the Israelites? Either he did it so that it would be the perfect illustration for Jesus to use, or Jesus just knew to use it as a perfect illustration. And here's what I mean. In his discussion with Nicodemus there, let's come down in, the cha in chapter 3 there. And let's start in verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Verse 17, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. The people of Israel had to believe in God, trust in God enough to look upon the serpent. And in order to be saved, we have to believe enough to look up to Jesus Christ, to come to him, to believe in him and what it was that he has done for us, and what it was that he has taught for us to do. Now, since we've been talking about Christians and equating them, us, with children of Israel and not rebelling against God and not walking in sin, what happens if we do sin? Do we still look up to Jesus? Well, absolutely. Turn with me, if you would, to 1 John chapter 2 for just a moment. 1 John chapter 2. John gives us great hope. That when we face temptation, we can say no. Paul guarantees it in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, where he tells us that God has given us a way of escape for every temptation that we face. But in 1 John chapter 2, John writes, My little children, these things I write to you so you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Verse 2, and he himself is a propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Jesus is still our advocate. If we rebel against God, we can come back to God, because Jesus is our advocate. He is our appe the appeasement. That's what propitiation means. He is the appeasement. How can we possibly by ourselves hope to appease an almighty God? By ourselves we cannot. But because of what Jesus did, we have that appeasement. We have that propitiation for our sins. We have an advocate with God. I think about Moses who would oftentimes run interference, so to speak, when the children of Israel sinned. There was one occasion, the specific instance kind of slips my mind a little bit. But the people were complaining and groaning and moaning. And God says, okay, here's a plague. And Moses told Aaron, hurry, take the censer and run it in and stop it. 
And so he runs with the censer and he puts it there where it needs to be. And immediately the plague ceased. So there were times that Moses, in a manner of speaking, was the advocate for the people. But Jesus is our advocate because he has paid the price for our sins. And if we are willing to do as verse 9 of chapter 1 says, then God will forgive us. He says in 1 John 1 verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We have to be willing to confess our sins unto God and through our advocate, the propitiation for our sins, ask him to forgive us and then we will be healed. We will be forgiven of our sins. For those who aren't Christians, what Jesus has done for you is he has become the perfect sacrifice. One more verse, and then we'll pull the lesson to a close. In Hebrews chapter 10, one more passage, I should say. Hebrews chapter 10, if you're not a Christian, consider what he has done for you, beginning in verse 5. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. And burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do your will, O God. Previously saying, Sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sin, you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And if you're not a Christian, you can be sanctified by the offering of Jesus Christ once for all. If you're willing to turn to him. If you're willing to believe what he has taught if you're willing to obey what he has commanded, then you too can have your sins washed away by the blood of the Lamb. I think about in Hebrews chapter 3 and chapter 4, the Apostle Paul, or the writer of Hebrews, if it be Paul, references a quote from David, where David warns the children of Israel not to harden their hearts as in the day of rebellion. Not to turn away from the Lord, but to trust in Him and to follow Him. And he says, because the first generation hardened their hearts, they did not enter into that promised rest. And then in chapter 4, on down in the text there, he says, because they did not enter in, there still remains a rest today. As long as we do not harden our hearts. How do we avoid being bitten? By the snake of sin, if you would, let's remember to trust in God. Let us remember not to rebel against Him and His Word. And if perchance we do when we are bitten by sin, then let us repent and look to Him and turn back today. If you're not a Christian, you need to become one of God's children. You can have all of your past sins washed away by the blood of the Lamb. All that guilt removed if you're willing to turn your life to following him. That's what repentance is. Peter told the people on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 verse 38 to repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Turn away from your life of sin that you've been walking on when you rejected Jesus Christ and you crucified him and now you follow him. Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. And then you be faithful unto death and you'll make it to that promised rest. If you are a Christian, you've not been living faithfully. You're like the children of Israel. You've been bitten by the serpent of sin. And the only way to be forgiven, to be healed, if you would, is to look back to Jesus Christ. Turn back to Him in humble repentance and obedience, and your sins will be forgiven. If you need the prayers of the congregation, or you're ready now to become one of God's children, come forward as we stand and as we sing.